was, was only part of our focus. Our key focus was how was the money being managed by, you know, on behalf of the shareholders by the officers and directors. So it was definitely a corporate governance direction, and it definitely came from the Division of Enforcement. Okay. Let me ask you on, on insider trading, Ted, and I see Paul Gonson is in the room, uh, misappropriation theory. How did that come about? Was that was that was, that was mostly general counsel? Or was that how did that come about, Paul? Do you remember? Well, Ted will remember as well too. It was that you want to come up and just get on the microphone here? <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna have trouble. You're a guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you have to use this over here because I think that's one of the most important. Uh, that was one of the most important legal uh, accomplishments that we've ever had in the insider trading, wasn't it, Herb? The, the misappropriation. Yeah. I'm, I'm just now, I'm just now paraphrasing Ted Levine, who's here, of course, to speak for himself. But I think it was the combination back in the uh, the late '60s and the '70s of the uh, rise in takeovers and also the uh, rise in options. So you were having situations where one company's going to take over another company. And by the use of options, you could leverage enormously. So if you put down a little bit of money, you could really make a huge bundle if you had inside information on a takeover. And uh, the theory that was in existence then, which was officers and directors owed a duty to their own shareholders not to disadvantage them, didn't apply when you were now talking about securities not of your own company, but securities of another company, the company about to be take, taken over. So there developed another theory, which was a theory, first it was called, a, you may recall some of us use the phrase market access or market information so is distinguished from inside information. The Supreme Court rejected that distinction, said no, there's just one theory. But eventually the theory developed that if you were defrauding the source of the information uh, as distinguished from people in the market, that also was a violation. And that's how the... the well, was that, well, well, how did, I, did that come about? Was it your creation, the general counsel? Or did it, I, I, I guess what you're saying, it came out of one of our cases that we developed, but you had to go and defend it in the, in the Court of Appeals, and we had to come up with... Does anybody know where the first, con, uh, first uh, uh, wording of the misappropriation theory well, it came? Out Chiarella. Chiarella. Yeah. 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 It came out of Chiarella. It came out of Chiarella. After the Supreme Court decision right. Chiarella, the program was a great loss, and we did two things. We adopted 14E3, a rule to deal with tender offers, t insider trading tender offers, right. and we started developing, looking for an alternative theory. The exact case, I don't remember, but there were a series of cases in that time period where we had to come up with alternative theories. Yes. You were gone. Oh, no, misappropriation was, uh, well, that, that, that was, of was during my time. Was of it? course, we lost, the, as, I, as most people here know, we lost the Chiarella case. Right. Yeah. Although the Chief Justice pointed out that it was because we had raised it too late. Oh. And, th and he said that if we had brought that up earlier, then, then uh, it might succeed. I have and a little umbrage at the word we. <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> we, we being the, the commission. The, the SEC brought a civil action against Mr. Chiarella, right. and he settled that action, and he paid over some $30,000 in trading profits. There was an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York who read about the settlement in the yeah. newspaper and without advising, I believe, I don't think Stanley knew about this until it was up in the Court of Appeals, yeah. without advising the SEC, went ahead and he indicted Mr. Chiarella for the action that the SEC had settled. And he was convicted and the Second Circuit affirmed the conviction and then uh, it went up to the Supreme Court. So the theory on which the case had been presented by the assistant U.S. attorney to the jury was a theory which wasn't a misappropriation theory. It was sort of the classical theory, but it didn't fit. And because it didn't fit, the Supreme Court said that Mr. Chiarella owed no duty to the people in the market. He was a stranger to them. He wasn't a fiduciary of theirs. He wasn't an officer and director of the companies he was trading in. And then the government said, well, what about this other theory, the misappropriation theory? And the Supreme Court said that in criminal law, as distinguished from civil law, you can only co affirm a criminal conviction based on the theory presented to the jury. Otherwise, it'd be sort of like a directed verdict, which you can't have in criminal law. Yeah. If this had been a civil case, then the Supreme Court could have considered that alternative theory 
because the rule on appeals in civil cases is you can affirm on any basis, even the basis not relied on in the district court. So the peculiarity that this was a criminal case meant the court couldn't reach it. But there were in four opinions of the justices some indication that this might be an acceptable theory in the next case. And then okay. it was really the enforcement division then was starting Thanks, to push Paul. those yeah. next cases. And un unfortunately, even though we didn't, the commission did not, was not the moving force behind the criminal case, the commission ended up, I think Ralph Farrar argued the case, or may, uh, or, or at least on behalf of the commission, and pressed the misappropriation theory at that point. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another rule. Rule 15C211, does anybody have some, <laughs> any idea what happened there? Who knows what it is, Raise your hand. You don't know 15C211? Well, I, I can tell you what it is. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Right. Herb, you, you remember that, what happened there? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. It was to try and put the responsibility in the over-the-counter market for people examining the financials of a company before they started trading in it uh, so that there would be some control. And it arose again because we had brought enforcement cases. Right. And the, the desire was not to have to bring enforcement cases, that they were trading all the stuff that didn't amount to anything and, and was just trading numbers uh, to put some responsibility on them. So that was the start back then. Well, and the problem, though, the problem that we encountered is that people went into the market and started making markets in these cases and, there was, and they weren't responsible. There was no way of breaking right. the cycle. Right. And, and I think we used the suspension, actually, and the 15C211 as a device to get at these two problems, which put a burden on the market maker and also to break the cycle. What happened was that, that market makers were trading what they called by the numbers. They didn't want to know what the company was about. They had no idea. We found stocks starting at a few pennies a, a share, going up to $100 a share. And when you asked the market maker, didn't know that the place had no business, had nothing they were doing, it was a complete shell. And so we put in the, the concept of know your security. In other words, one of the great concepts in the, in the, uh, in, in the securities area is the know your rules. You got to know your customer and you got to know your security and uh, many of the, and, and others like other things like that. And that was the concept and it's still again one of the, one of the uh, really important rules. And these all came about as a result of enforcement work. Not only did we bring the case, but we worked with the, the, uh, the regulatory divisions in developing the remedy. Let's talk about strategies. One of the things that, uh, that the public doesn't see is they do not see uh, that when the, SE, when the division was, was, was taking action, that there was some thought that went into those actions that they were taking. And, uh, For good reason. Well, the access theory. Uh, it's now got a new name called Gatekeeper. David, what do you know about access theory? Well, the access theory is really one that's designed to, to give you the most bang for your enforcement buck. Uh, the, the theory is that when people want to get to the market, uh, they can't get to the market without going through certain access points or securing the necessary advice of other professionals. So if an issuer who has uh, uh, got an improper agenda wants to get to the public market, he needs professionals, he needs uh, financial services, or he needs a broker-dealer or an underwriter, he needs a lawyer and he needs an accountant and so the theory is that since these people are either the gatekeepers or the points of access to the market these are the places that we would look at very carefully and hold this category of professional to a very high level of accountability for their conduct and by that way uh, control the flow into the marketplace. And, and in other words, there was a program designed to go after the entities that were responsible for the, for the uh, people getting access to the marketplace and that they could control their people. And as a result of that, Irv, that's what you developed with the, in connection with the whole compliance system, where, you, where every broker-dealer has to have a compliance program. Yes, correct. Stanley, the, I, 
The, it didn't develop the way you just described it, though. I it, didn't. No. It developed because <laughs> you used to ask the question, why did this happen? And really, the way access theory developed was when you ask the question, why did it happen, you look beyond simply the entity, let's say it's a corporation, and you started saying, well, how could this possibly happen? I remember the conversation. Where were the accountants? How uh, oh, well, that came a little later. That was a little later, though. Stanley did this on purpose, really. Well, I don't know which agency he was at. Was this the SEC no, or some no, other agency? Uh, that was no, but, no, but Ted, I think, I, I, think, Ted, I think it came out in part because Stanley was asking, as Irv was, how did this happen in a place like Merrill Lynch or in First Boston? Where was the compliance program? Where was the supervisors? Where, were the, where was the system in place that would have and should have prevented this? And in effect saying, and I think that's where the legislation came out, that basically said you have to have, and if you want credit, you have to have, in fact, a compliance program for the brokerage industry, at least, that said it's in place. And once you had that in place, you, in effect, had a defense to an enforcement action. I don't think it's ever been successfully um, utilized, but it was that that basically well, put the actually, compliance program in place. Actually, Irv, I think it was we didn't have the manpower to police everybody, is right. my recollection. So we, we, had, we, had a, we had to conscript the private sector, and we wanted to, in effect, transfer the obligation from the commission to the private sector. We couldn't bring every case, but in the cases we brought, we made sure that those firms would take steps to prevent it from happening again, and that's why you have the whole compliance system. Is that right? Correct. Well, uh, you don't want to say anything else? Well, but, <laughs> Stanley, we, we use the same concept, yeah. really, in, in a lot of cases, including a lot of the foreign payments cases, right. where we would do enough investigation to have a basic case, but know that we had not done the full investigation that was required. So we would then bring a quick enforcement action, and as a part of the resolution, we would require that, that the defendant issuer, public company, appoint a special counsel who would be required to undertake, in effect, continue the investigation internally with a certain degree of independence so that he could do as he or she could do their job and then they would prepare a report and submit it to the commission so that was another well, example of, of, of putting responsibility off onto the subject of investigation and freeing up our resources well, to do other things. The basic theory of the securities laws going all the way back was the commission was supposed to be in the background with the cannon or shotgun, as Justice Douglas said, <clears throat> and that the industry was supposed to, through self-regulation and self-discipline in the firms or compliance, as we used to call it, uh, make the system work properly. Today, the growth in the industry is exponentially greater than it was during our time. And this commission, with all the resources it has, is not going to be able to go out and put a supervisor or a policeman in every institution or every business out there that contributes to the marketplace or operates in the marketplace. And so the programs have to be designed to impose on the people who are out there having the direct access to the markets or the direct access to, to investors to have programs in place that protect the investors and society from mispractices. And therefore, you're now getting an increasing regulatory imposition on what companies have to do. For example, take just the certification process that now is in place under the Sarbanes Act. If you read that, it's not just the certification of the documents. It's a whole litany of things that have to be done in order to give a basis for the CEO or the chief financial officer to put his name on a certification that the financials are correct, regardless of gap, that they fairly present the uh, uh, success of the company in terms of its finances and also in its operations and in its disclosures. So the whole emphasis is, again, let's get the disclosures out there. As Justice Brandeis said, it's the greatest thing you can have in any field is, is sunlight on what's going on. And you see it in some of the disclosures that are coming out in the present context. For example, look at the impact that the disclosure on the pension given to uh, one of the leading members of the 
management community, which showed how low these things were getting in terms of, of the greed that was involved there. Those things, just in disclosure, did more than any enforcement case you could bring. And I think that our background shows that enforcement is important in sort of being the backstop in getting people's attention that they must obey these things, and it's in their self-interest to do it, otherwise there will be serious consequences that will have personal consequences as well as economic well, well, What would you say, Wally, that you would advise a broker-dealer client about knowing, I mean, let, 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 me, let me go two steps. If you were now at the commission, uh, how would you take this compliance concept that we started to the next step? How should the current commission be using that concept? Do you think let, they've, let me, they've exhausted me, the use of it by now? No, not at all. But let, let me go back to uh, that my understanding of, of, of what we're talking about in terms of access theory and so forth. I saw the access theory as, as, a, as a tactic that was employed within a strategy. Now, the strategy, for example, we, we had an interest in municipal bond cases. Dave and I had, had uh, right. we, we know, I remember, you remember one time I'd come to Urban Stanley and I said, you know, there, I read something in the Wall Street Journal about these municipal securities dealers in the South who are all called bond daddies and they're selling these mm. defunct or, or these uh, bankrupt uh, issues, bond issues, and charging whopping markups. And I said, well, you know, it'd be something interesting to look at. So they said, yeah, go, go look at it. So I went down and I visited a couple of these places and I came back and I said, you know, these, these shops are really boiler rooms. You know, I'm sure you guys had seen them, but I had never seen them. I had read about what boiler rooms were like, but I'd never seen them. I said, these shops are boiler rooms and we should do something about it. So they said, go to it. So Dave and I went to work on that and we eventually we brought, I would say maybe 10 cases against companies and we enjoined 50 individuals or whatnot. And our strategy was to bring enough cases to demonstrate that there was a need for regulation in the municipal securities area. Now, as part of that strategy, we brought the cases and, and then brought that to the attention of the Hill and, and Market Reg and, and worked out this legislative program. But within the strategy, there was a tactic. We also wanted to stamp out the problem and as we were going along. And the tactic was to use the access theory. We first went after the, the dealers who were charging the excessive markups because they, pr they provided access. Then we, then we moved over to the underwriters. And then finally we moved over to the lawyers. And that's where the screaming really started because we were trying to bring the lawyers into in, and have them responsible for the disclosure and the offering statements and for the, the uh, opinions that they were rendering that these bond deals were real deals as opposed to shams. So I saw, it, I saw the access theory, if you will, where you put pressure on professionals as a tactic. The overall strategy was to get legislation to regulate the area. But within that strategy, we, we had the access theory and we you know, went to put the pressure on the various uh, access points. I'll give you just a little color and background on that one. We went down to, we actually litigated some of these cases and we went down to file our action in Memphis, in federal court in Memphis against this, these bond daddies. <laughs> and uh, as is customary, I stopped into the U.S. Attorney's Office as a courtesy to let him read the complaint before I filed it. Uh, and the complaint really was, it was a classic boiler room, outrageous, just classic, with markups over contemporaneous cost on these bonds in the vicinity of 25, 50, and 100 percent. And he read the complaint and he said to me, well, I don't think you got much of a case. <laughs> he says, you know, I don't see that there's much difference here between the used car salesman. You know, you sell your product for what you can get. So I'm, you're not going to have much luck in there. <laughs> and fortunately, the judge saw it differently. We tried the case and won. But we did end up going to Congress because at that point, dealers who dealt exclusively in municipal bonds were exempt from registration as broker dealers. Right with the SEC. And we'd never dealt with municipal bond people before, and so we ended up getting legislation. That exemption was removed, and the problem went away. Now, one thing, Arab, that we, that our problem was that we didn't have all the nice toys that the current enforcement group <laughs> has. We couldn't go and get bans on uh, officers, directors. Uh, we had trouble, you know, getting fines or getting money back. Uh, Sure we but did, that, so that, 
Ted, did that stop us? What did we do about it? Did we just say, yeah, we can't do it, so we'll go home? I, I and, got a case go right here where we did it in 1975. What, what, tell me about the case, David. Uh, it was SEC versus Technicolor, Inc. Yeah, what and, Or Technoculture, Inc. And uh, <laughs> we remember that one, Ted? And uh, this was just a shell promoter that was doing it over right. and over again. And we went out and, and we got an injunction against him. And the judge enjoined him from assuming a position as or continuing as an officer director of any public company unless he said so. Well, it helped. It helped. Yeah, Dan, what do you think of that? In the interest Did of you know about that? In the interest of full disclosure. Yeah. But, but Stanley, the, um, the use of, the, uh, to me, the greatest tool uh, in the modern enforcement arsenal was the consent, uh, without of which the program would either back when we were there or today could not function as a practical matter. And the consent gave you the ability, and actually ancillary relief as part of that, or to develop different ways of getting remedies that you, that you could not specifically look to a statute to get. And if you settled 80% of your cases at all times, or 90%, which we did, you were able to meld the theories of what we wanted to do and put it into practice in the consent. Because once you had the violation and you're trying to be remedial, the consent gave you that, whether it's back in Vesco or Parvin Dorman or Westgate or all, it just gave you the, and it was only the creative mind that could come up with the relief, whether it was disgorgement or things like that. So I, to me, the greatest thing we had was the consent and still is today. Well, that's of course what made the remaining 10% of the cases that we had to try so awful. <laughs> <laughs> you mean, we well, only tried the bad cases? Well, of course we had to try the bad cases. <laughs> I, I think what we did, well, our one loss record was uh, like, sort of like the Orioles today, I guess. It wasn't too good. <laughs> what we did was we used the power of the courts to extend the statutory grants of power. Uh, the first cases we did, we said the court can appoint the receiver. SEC may not have that authority, but the court could do it. The next step was once you had a good case in there, the court could order restitution. And we emphasized that once the SEC was in there and got a decree, it wasn't the SEC's decree anymore, it was the court's decree. And so you, Your Honor, can use these things to get these scoundrels and to stop them or to give the money back. And discouragement the same way. Discouragement the same way. And so that uh, approach was used. Inherent powers it gets of the back, court. It gets back to what you said much earlier in this program, though. We had a uh, reception in the courts that I think in the late 80s and certainly in the 90s reversed itself and the courts did not understand or at least appreciate the uh, program's policy and the policy of the statute to protect the public and so they looked at this more like it was some negligence case out there where two parties uh, were performing so I, I think you got to get that culture out into the uh, people who really control the industries so that the leaders of the industry will be establishing that culture when there are people below them. Yeah, now, the, uh, well, so we were able to accomplish many of the things that the commission today is able to accomplish, although they're doing it with specific authority. We did it through the consent decree. Is that your point, Ted? Yeah, ex yes, except things, yeah. uh, which uh, I actually think hurts the program. What's uh, that? One is civil penalty. Because yeah. you get the scourging, but there, you didn't, we didn't have the civil penalty that right. way. And right. two, uh, we, we, I think the uh, C and D uh, is, is, can be used, can be helpful, but cannot be. In other words, I think it, it goes we, both We ways. used that too, didn't we? Weren't there C and Ds? No. no. Oh, sure we did. No, we used 15 the 21 C4. But oh, we brought out C and Ds, I'm telling you, we had, by consent. We didn't have the oh, by, by consent. Oh, no, even with the consent, we, we did, did it with, yes, we did, we Sorry. did it with consent. Yeah, I learned never to disagree with the yeah, boss. I'm telling you, we I did it tell with you, we, <laughs> that's one thing we never <laughs> did. Yeah. Uh, Art Matthews uh, recommended. I'll have to, Dave, did we do it? What you would say is, you would say that the, that, like the firm had to agree not to violate the security yeah, right. laws again, but it, it didn't say cease and desist. Well, my, I'll, I'll what the to... person in the audience, Dan Fox, said <laughs> yes. was that they would include something like that in the decree, but uh, it didn't say. I cease remember. And I remember we used the word in, in the, that they would cease and desist, but I'll have to go and. But, but you know, not not all of the progress that we made in terms of ancillary relief was through consent. Now, for example. Yeah. 
there was there was a case that we brought uh, years ago that we where we litigated a very important co corporate governance issue. That was Canadian Javelin. You remember Canadian Javelin was a Canadian company, and we said that their filings with the SEC were improper, inadequate, and so forth. And we actually litigated in, in the Southern District of New York a, a provision where we requested the court to appoint a special <coughs> review person and a person who would specially prepare the filings of, of the company, require the board of Canadian Javelin to, to Instruct the, to, to instruct this special review person to have this, uh, to to do this work and to have this power, and that was actually litigated and opposed. And I went up and I argued the motion in front of Judge McMahon, and uh, Mike Eisenberg, if you recall, was the person that we had appointed for that for that work. Okay. And it, and the other side opposed it vigorously, and the judge ordered it. And there was an example of, of corporate governance in the very early stages in the litigated context, not in a consent context where we imposed something that was very important in terms of the filing process and the... Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, the technoculture case was litigated as well, and that guy ended up in yeah, jail but there's, a, the, there's a quote from uh, Management Dynamics, which was a Second Circuit case litigated, which I think makes Irv's point, if I could read it, where Judge Kaufman, I believe, said, the SEC appears not as an ordinary litigant, but as a statutory guardian charged with safeguarding the public interest and enforcing the security laws and therefore they would treat the request for ancillary relief differently than the private litigant. Okay, right. And I think that summed up really the attitude in this 1975 of the Second Circuit and, and makes the point as to how we're able to get the relief that someone else might not get. Yeah. One of the things that the Commission has recently done, which I think I, it's one of the greatest acts of enforcement that I can, I can recall, <laughs> was the... Uh, was the recertification. I mean, that was brilliant. It, uh, it uh, diffused this whole situation. It made current, it brought everything current, and, uh, and it was done through use of the provision 21A. Now, to go back to the old days, uh, we used to use that 21A provision in many different ways. Uh, Ted, do you want to start out with the... Uh... Yeah, well, 21A uh, was used actually on the governance side as a way of identifying conduct that we found in cases where the commission wanted to speak to a general practice but not bring an enforcement matter. Sterling Homex, I believe, was the first case, which was a case that we brought, which we sued the company, we sued the underwriters, we sued the accountants, and we used 21A to address the conduct of the directors who should have known about the fraudulent financials in connection with the offering. But it then went on in a number of cases, Gould, National Student Marketing, there were a whole series of 21A reports culminating, I believe, with a 21A report written by then Commissioner Loomis, if I'm not mistaken, where he, there was actually some discussion, if someone can correct me, where Phil Loomis, as commissioner, discussed the use of 21A because there was some opposition at the commission, and he actually wrote as part of it, maybe um, everyone's looking, maybe I, I dreamt this, but I think there was some contention, it may have been around Roberta Camel, it may have been around the time period where there was some question about it, but the commission used it to, develop, to go to Irv's point, essentially. Here's practices we found which are not appropriate, and this is a way of improving conduct. And, the commission used it. And I, I guess more recently in the uh, Solomon Brothers scandal, it was used once again in terms of discussing uh, well, the responsibility the legal, of the The legal issue was that uh, Commissioner Cromwell raised was can you, is it fair to have a 21A report that's non consensual? And the point there was that she it's thought that, that the party who was going to get a blast of bad publicity ought to have the right to make a, uh, uh, a response. Now, uh, or have a right to say why it should be issued. But we used, uh, uh, as I recall, we were pretty creative. We used 21A quite a bit, did we not? Yes. And, and Irv, you used it in the, in the market structure, did you not, in the hearings? Yeah. Uh, 20, well, 21A was, was an outlet that was very important to the program. You remember the New York City report was a 21A report. Right. And we right. brought that because there were... As you recall, there were serious political overtones at the time that, that affected the investigation. We were conducting an investigation into the sale of municipal securities by New York City. 
And there were a lot of practices that had gone on that we, we came up with during the investigation that were, were serious and had to be treated. But there was also a concern that if we brought an enforcement action, it would, it would appear to be directed at the Democratic administration in the city of New York, who was then in, in, in power. So a 21A report was, was utilized at that point just to, to put out a report without, any, without a lot of editorial uh, uh, comment about, about who did right and who did wrong, and just lay it out there with all the problems as a mechanism, again, to try to advance reform through legislation. It was all part of the, this whole municipal bond effort that we had taken. And I thought it was important because I, I don't know that we would ever have gotten an enforcement case through uh, with respect to the actions of the various politicians and so forth at the time, whereas 21A report gave us a, a vehicle to get out there and discuss these issues in great detail and to alert the public to the well, issues well, and I think, bring about I think, a cure. Yeah, I think um, Stan, what Wally's talking about, and I, I don't remember a National Student Marketing Report Ted, as such, but I remember with Pete Marwick we did a report, which was essentially a 2E proceeding, where we got out the practices and tried to reform things um, by using the speaking vehicle. The 21A was used for that. I don't remember, though, Stanley. I mean, I think I ha we have to give the c current commission credit for using 21A, in which they did, in a way which, uh, frankly, at least to my memory, I don't think has ever been done oh, before. Oh, I think it's terrific. And, and, and that is to require, affirmatively, uh, the CEOs and CFOs to certify but, to something that I don't think had ever been done before. No, but I think that 21A is one of the most incredible provisions that any agency can have. I, I, don't, I, I, I think there's still other avenues that you can use oh, 21A. Absolutely. But, but I don't think and, it had been used. And I'm not going to tell it now because I want to use it for some of my clients, but that's all right. Well, uh, I, uh, I, I, I will surprise them. But uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the point was that 21A um, <laughs> uh, has so many ramifications. And again, to the great credit of the sure they can compel someone to, to make a statement. And before the certification concept, if you recall, the commission went to, uh, was it WorldCom, and said, we want to report in 24 hours of what happened. The, the 21 says you can do it. It, it, gives you, it gives the commission powers to investigate. It gives commission powers to require statements. It gives commission powers to publish information. Terrific. But one of the things that, uh, what, what I think that reflects back to our time and to the present commission, is the fact of scrubbing through those provisions to utilize every crumb that you can utilize. And we had to use them because we didn't have all the nice toys. But let me give you another area, and Irv, you probably remember this as well as anybody, uh, the concept of public versus private proceedings. Now, no enforcer in, in his or her right mind would recommend a private proceeding, but we did, and we did it in, in, in a way that advanced the program. Do you remember that in the, in the back office cases? Yes, what will happen there was the uh, industry lost control of its rec records and uh, it was a, a national uh, disaster. And the remedy that we wanted was to get them back in control of their what records. Year was that? And so, uh, for example, in the 16. one case, the Lehman case right. that I recall, Stanley, called them in and said, you better go out there and hire 50 accountants and get your books and records in shape, otherwise we're going to suspend you. Yeah, there was failed, there was, they couldn't reconcile they failed to receive and failed to deliver because of the volume and, and a number of firms out of sync and, and that... It was endemic right. and it was a, right. a yeah. circular, circular thing, thing because it affected every firm in the industry. Well, and everyone was running around the street at the end of the day delivering stock certificates. The volume, I checked just before I came down, in 1970, and these I think were in the late 60s, yeah. But the average daily volume on the, the New York Stock Exchange in 1970 was about 10, 11 million shares a day. So it's... Well, it, the reason know, they lost control in know. those days, they didn't have a centralized clearing settlement right. system. Everybody settled with every other broker-dealer he dealt with in the street. The only one that had a program was that was a centralized one, was the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. Right. And so uh, there we used the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange system and induce the other exchanges uh, within the time periods that we could do to get control uh, over their own settlement periods, and that was the ultimate solution. But we had to solve the problem in the interim, and in the interim we used the, the process that I just described. You know, if you look back in the history of the Commission from its start, 
in the registration process, the statute only provided for a stop order proceeding. But the people there were ingenious enough. They instituted what was called the letter of comment. It exists today, in which they would uh, send a comment to the filer and say, here's what we think uh, is wrong in your filing, and give you an opportunity to correct it. And I think that kind of approach, imagination using whether it's 21A or it's 15C211 or 10B5 or something else, was what made the commission's programs uh, so effective over the years. Yeah. On, I, I, on the public versus private, or what happened was when we brought, we had to actually rack our brains. I recall this, uh, and uh, because we had to do something to the firm, but we couldn't disturb the whole industry. I mean, we were afraid of the public. There'd be a run on the bank, and that would have been a, a catastrophic. And so, in those days, very few cases were brought against New York Stock Exchange member firms. And so what we did is we looked at the, uh, at the we used to literally look at the law, and, we, and it came, occurred to me, it says that the, uh, uh, the, the uh, proceedings, I think it says may be public, which indicates it may be private. And the theory was, we, Irv and I, the strategy was that uh, we said what we'll do is we need something to shake Lehman Brothers up. And so we'll institute a proceeding. But what we'll do is we'll make it a private proceeding so the public won't know right away what's going on. Hopefully, we can force them by use of the proceeding to come in and settle it. And that way, they would go out and hire 150 accountants, I think it was, or from, a, from the, because they didn't have people. Bring it into compliance. And then what we would do is then we would announce the proceeding and announce the sanction, which was a nothing sanction because they had done everything. And so we use that, we must have used that in at least 10 to 15 cases against major brokerage firms. But that's what you have to do in, 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 with these statutes. The statutes, uh, that was one of the reasons in, this, in the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, uh, bill. Uh, there are so many provisions in that law that, uh, uh, that, that can be used. Now, yeah, it's good to have... Obviously, it's important that this, the, the Congress, uh, you know, gave a uh, message. But you look at 13A under the 34 Act, and the Commission has full authority over accountants, over what statement, what what the financial statements uh, should contain. Uh, they forget about GAAP. They don't have to rely on GAAP. They can set up their own system. It's there in the law. It's never been used. Now, I'm not being critical that the commission hasn't used it, but what I'm saying is it's never been used to, uh, to, to, to deal with this thing. There are a lot of other provisions in the law. For example, we used to use, and you fellows can join on all this, with suspensions of trading as an effective tool until we got hit a little bit on that one, but... Uh, but. <laughs> I thought you were going to private proceedings in Sarbanes-Oxley because all the proceedings that this new accounting board is going to have to bring... Yeah, but that was not... That Stanley, was, Stanley, that was not our... Hey, we used to bring successive yeah. suspensions for maybe a year call or two. Them, <laughs> call them rollovers. Roll but, yeah. but, Stanley, roll I, there, it, what, I think there's a, a really important point, what you and Irv were just saying about the, the paperwork crisis cases. And that is that we try to fix the problem. Right. And it would have been so easy, because there were this host of firms on the street who were just flat out out of compliance. Books and records were out of whack, their net capital, and, and a lot of other things. They couldn't account for things. They were just out of ratio. The easiest thing would have been for us to rush in and, and enjoin or sue a half a dozen New York Stock Exchange member firms, but that wouldn't have fixed the problem. And, and virtually all the enforcement actions that were brought, the overriding objective is not just to sue the person uh, and so on. It is to sue. whatever you do long term, you're trying to fix the problem. You got to and that's what was yeah. done there. And, and David now runs the program for the New York Stock Exchange, so I'm sure he's using many of these uh, of these strategies. But go back to suspension of trading. I don't. And and uh, and um, um, stop order proceedings. I noticed that the commission now is using stop order proceedings, which they hadn't used uh, and, and, and before. Uh, now, why would you use a stop order proceeding when you can go get an get an injunction? Uh, it depends upon the facts and circumstances. It may well be that a stop order might be more uh, appropriate than going into a into a court. Suspension of trading. 
uh, up until recently, the commission hadn't used that uh, too much. You think it's a, a, a li too little used, or uh, or you think it's used just right, Ted? What do you think on suspensions? I think uh, the commission's using it now more, more than they did before. More than they did, and they're using it as an appropriate way of stopping where they hit. the internet and some of these other scams has created a lot of securities that are floating out there are worthless. And I think the 10-day suspension is a good way of quickly protecting the public where you have that going on, uh, and I think it can be used that way, and also as a good notice provision. Well, well, yeah, and I think that's the way we ended up using it. Yeah. Let me, all right, we got a few minutes left. Let us go and uh, ask these questions, and, and everybody just join in. Uh, uh, what can the commission get today from the way enforcement was carried on in your day. Is there anything... Stanley, you skipped the most eth important part, which is really a dedication to Irv. What's that? Which is the ethical, and you, frankly, the ethical lessons that come out well, of an enforcement it, program, and you can't do that with this fellow sitting next to no, you. No, the only reason that, <laughs> the, the only reason I, I skipped that was because we discussed it in the last hour about the ethical, uh, uh, you know, the, the problems we well, had. Well, but I, I think... I think Irv gave a speech to that, yeah. Well, I... You want to give another I, one? On ethical problems? Well, I think it's important not only for the commission. Uh, yeah. It's important for but, the but, industry, but, but the more point, important point is the that the two of you were at the When it is attempting to uh, impose on its regulatory people a high standard of conduct, it has to be above that in its own performance. Yeah, but I think you're overlooking the contribution, Irv, that you made when you were appointed to the commission in the face of a scandal in order to restore the integrity of the commission to the staff, so that the staff would believe in the integrity of the process. After Brad Cook had to resign as chairman, um, and you know, I just say that not as a not as as something. I think it's important to understand the process because we've been through those periods. Stanley himself was involved in a situation where he was basically told by the White House to kill a case, and 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 um, you know. Acted well, appropriately. Well, so I wasn't told, but they, they uh, told it through an intermediary. Is yeah. that the, is that Vesco? Yeah. Yeah. But go ahead. To, uh, you, uh, I mean, we, we lived through these. We all but lived isn't through. that part of the history? Well, we all, our, I mean, while you lived through one, what was this? Velocian was your scandal? What was that that you lived through? <laughs> on the Hill? The speaker's case. The was speaker. That, he was the... Yeah, weren't you in the... Was he hung the, out in the speaker's was office. Was that your case, the Velocian? Something with it. But, can, Stanley, can I come back to one of the things uh, that you Please identified forward. early, uh, which I think is relevant both today and was relevant we did is, is the fairness of an enforcement program. Do so uh, you think that that's what the staff can learn today? I think, I think that's a good yes, point you're I, making. I, I think it is. That's Herb's hallmark. Yeah. And, I, and it is, and actually I was, one of the things in, in preparing for this, looking back, one of the things that I under, under took in my efforts I found was the Red Book, the guide to taking testimony. As you recall, in the late 60s, <laughs> there was no structure within the division of what the rights are, and we created and in fairness to the respondents, a whole, what was called the Red Book, I think it may still be the Red Book, I don't know today, where we put out a whole guide to our staff on how to comport itself relative to conducting an investigation. And I think this notion of being fair, given the power we had, was one of the hallmarks of what uh, I think Irvin Stanley promoted. And I think a lesson could be learned today, or it should continue. In other words, here, this is the time that really the staff and the commission uh, has to use restraint more than ever before because they've been given all this new power and there's nothing that's going to stop them. We and they got powers now that, uh, and this in this culture, it's going to go through it. And the staff does have to, and the commission does have to use restraint. I'd, I'd like to add one thing to that, and I think it's something that uh, yeah. permeated the years that I was in enforcement, and that is the use of a very uncommon uh, attribute called common sense. <laughs> and I have found that uh, many, many times uh, a zealous attitude uh, overwhelms common sense. And I think that one of the greatest things that the enforcement division at least demonstrated to me was uh, the use of common sense. I had been in the private practice at all for 20 years before I came here, as you may recall. And uh, uh, I found that... Um, by and large, for the most part, common sense was exercised in, in, uh, in great abundance. And I think that one of the greatest legacies that any of us who were there can have passed on is that the use of common sense in investigations and in treatment of people 
conducting the investigations mm -hmm. and fitting right in with Ted's views and on the uh, the so-called Red Book. Yeah, but actually, you know, the interesting was thing was we, we uh, drew we drew distinctions in the enforcement division when we were recommending case to the commission cases to the commission. We were not on autopilot. In other words, we did not say that every person who had a brush with the problem had to be dumped into a case. Right. We, tried to, we tried to bring cases that made a lot of sense because the people who were truly involved were included in the cases. And we tried to, to bring common sense, as, as Ben said, to the range of charges that we brought. And that was important because we had to have credibility. We had to have credibility with the commission. We had to have credibility with the bar when we brought these cases. So there was definitely an effort to approach a case in a way, something other than automatically trying to, to bring every single charge that you could bring or every single person that you could bring. And that was highlighted especially in, in the uh, foreign payments in the yeah, question. I, 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 I would just add, say, it, extend that a little bit. I think that the staff has to feel that they can be aggressive, there's a lot of work to do, and they will be supported if they're aggressive, but you have to balance it with fairness. In other words, if and it's and it's much easier, frankly, to be aggressive than it is to be fair. It it takes a certain amount of experience and security in yourself or your managers to make a decision not to sue someone just because it doesn't need to be done. It's easier. But it's Dave, it's easier and safer to, 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 to be aggressive. So I think it's, it's part of, uh, there's a balance, and part of it is a lot, is, uh, I think, experience. I, I remember, uh, Stanley, exactly what Dave's talking about. I remember a case that was not a case. You had brought a case against a number of the institutions and senior people, and then there was a young kid who had gone to the <coughs> finest schools <coughs> who had basically learned to launder money. And instead of suing this kid, you brought him into your office and you had a face-to-face -face conversation with him, but basically you told him we were going to give him a pass and you told him all of the blessings he had gotten and brought a non-case. And to me, that was one of the finest. No, I think the day I arrived as a, as a lawyer, uh, I felt good about it, or it was a time that I had recommended the suit of a lawyer who was a compliance director in a firm and that when I looked at the facts, I learned that he had told the, uh, his boss not to do something. And we had an aggressive staff that uh, insisted that we name him uh, because he didn't do enough. He had to quit. And I thought that was asking too much to require him to quit a job. So after the commission had authorized the action and we had gone about to bring it, I told her I was going to go back to the commission and say that my conscience would not permit me to sue this person. Irv said, go ahead and we drop that person from the lawsuit. That's when you know that you've arrived, when you can do something and that, and that thing. But let me say this, and I guess we got about a second left. Uh, what, I am, uh, what I am so ecstatic about in this day and age is that, first of all, there is tremendous support out there for the commission and the enforcement program. Uh, the enforcement division has good people, and I'm being self-serving because my son's there, but uh, <laughs> but I'm talking about right up to the top, uh, 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 and, and, and uh, the Cutlers and, uh, and the Thompsons and all the rest of the people all the way down. Now, but even more important, not more important, but as important, is you've got a fantastic commission now, and I am so proud to see uh, the, this commission with the... Uh, intellect that's there now, it is absolutely incredible, and there ought to be some really great things happening. I think you saw what happened with the certification, how, you know, nobody gives the chairman of the commission any credit for what they do, but look how that diffused this terrible situation out there. You don't hear people talking anymore about, you know, companies folding or whatnot. I mean, before that day in, in August, uh, Everybody thought the whole, uh, the whole uh, community was going to, the whole, broker, the whole uh, financial community was collapsing. And that thing really calmed things. It was a brilliant act, and you're going to see a lot more brilliant, I think, from this commission. But I do think what our panel said, Irv, that the fairness is, is still a very important thing. What do you think this is well, to used to conclude? Have, when somebody used to come and ask whether something was legal to do, uh, we used to say that's not 
like the question you asked. The question is, assume it's legal to do it, is it fair to do it? That's the standard that you ought to apply. And I think that is why the enforcement division could be as aggressive and imaginative in its program, uh, and yet accomplish respect among the people of Sudan, who recognize that they are fair in our attempt to improve their operations and to make it easier for them to make a good buck in their business, and at the same time serve their customers and society well. Well, listen, I thank you people that have, have stayed with us. You're terrific to have been here. Uh, and I hope you've panels. enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed as much as I've enjoyed it. Oh, the panels are, are uh, I told them they're going to see the, the A material here. Thank you very, thank very you. much. Good guys. Good job. Yeah, very nice. I think well it's important. Done. I think it's important. Oh, it was a good, good. history.